Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Great. Uh, so I'm Steve Moretzky. Uh, this is Dave Rawl, Juan Grill. And uh, for many years, we've been doing uh, a session called The Year in Free-to-Play Games. And this year, as an experiment, uh, instead of doing it as a lecture, we thought we would try it as a series of roundtables. The idea being, instead of you know, just the three of us sort of pontificating on what we think the most interesting games and trends are in the past year, we would instead try to gather the group wisdom and kind of get a wider circle of people and a wider you know, number of perspectives and you know, hopefully get a, a really interesting discussion going on what the interesting games or the interesting developments within live games or the you know kind of uh, most interesting trends going on within each particular part of the free to play space and what we can do to use those to predict what's going to happen in the future. So uh, this segment, this half hour is devoted to Social Casino, which is um, uh, certainly the, the biggest segment of free to play games if you just look at uh, the number of games that are represented in the top grossing lists. Uh, everything on this chart that's in green, which unfortunately as projected is certainly fairly indistinguishable from the blue, but <laughs> everything in green here is Social Casino. It's, it's about 39% of the top 100 grossing games. Um, so uh, anyway, I, you know, I think uh, some uh, possible discussion topics would be uh, what are the most interesting developments that people have seen in Social Casino uh, in the past year, what new interesting products, or what uh, new developments, you know, new content, new features, you know, within products that have been around for years, and of course in Social Casino, the players are very sticky and products do tend to stick around for many years. Uh, there, you know, certainly have been new products though, I think, you know, uh, one certainly worth pointing out is Wizard of Oz Block uh, from Zynga, which uh, is, is one of the few new social casino games to kind of break into the, the top uh, of the charts uh, over the past six or nine months. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, other potential topics uh, to discuss would be things like whether the social casino player is sort of inherently different from the casual player. Is the social casino player pretty much like the casual player demographically? They certainly seem to be. Um, but you know, is there an inherent difference? Are they much less sort of prone to accept innovation? Uh, are they much more interested just in the moment to moment core gameplay and less in sort of longer term loops and meta gameplay? Uh, I think that would be an interesting topic. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, rather than us proposing the topics to to talk about, you know, I would be interested in hearing other people say, here is a topic related to social casino, you know, that I would like to, to see discussed. So anyway, given that intro, the floor is open. And um, just, you know, if you want to speak, make sure you grab one of the mics and let's get going. James here. So I'm James Smith from uh, executive producer at MobilityWare. Uh, if, if you feel it's worth the time, I would appreciate um, some of you who are really into social casino and slots helping explain to me, um, usually as a game designer, I like to balance skill and luck. And, and in slots, I don't see the skill. I'm sure there's some in there. Like, er, <laughs> and so like, help me appreciate what the slots player is looking for. And you know, I'm, I'm so trained to normally struggle with this skill and luck. And I don't know if there's a way to talk to that, but I'd be interested. Tony, you want to answer that? Er, I'm Ernie Lafke. I, uh, were, I'm CEO of a company called Red Emerald Gaming. I was at IGT slash WagerWorks for over 12 years. I've been making online slots for the real money market for that long, so, and successfully. So hopefully I have a good answer to your question. Um, there, are, there basically is no skill in slots. It's not skill at all. It's all about, well, one of the first ways to understand why a slot game works is to run down to a casino and drop about 100 bucks into some slot machines. It makes the experience completely different and you start to understand it from the player's perspective a lot better. Slots really, I, I have only now come to terms with why players would play them for free. 
Uh, and I think it's because these, these players are uh, actually casino players, and the I could go into all kinds of details, but basically they're people who already like slots. That's what I think, and that's what all the data I've seen suggests. So you, you first put some money into a machine, all right? You have to remember the core of the experience is money at risk. That's the tension. It's inherent, right? If uh, my game designer friend says, if you're playing a game for money and you're not, and your adrenaline isn't running, bet more. It's that simple. So. Now, then there's, I could talk for an entire half hour about this, but just a few things are, uh, the number one thing that you can control as a game designer is anticipation. It's, it's absolutely the biggest key factor in the enjoyment of a game. It's all about like, and you have to understand also that the endorphin rush you get from a near miss is the same as the one you get when you get a win. So near misses, uh, celebrating wins, you never, ever, ever emphasize losses. It's all about creating gameplay that creates anticipation uh, and uh, creates that sense that a big win is just around the corner. And I could go on and on, but, or you could hire me. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I mean, I, I have a question for you because uh, the, uh, we, people who are working on social casino, might not use the same terminology as people who are work on, on, on real gambling slot machine. Um, we call the flow, the, 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 the goal is to get the player in, a, in, that, in this flow of anticipation, yes. right? Yes, of absolutely. the constant stream that I want a little bit, but next one is gonna be bigger. That's and, exactly right. And, and maintain the key, when you're, when you're testing your slot machine, are you keeping that player in that flow, you know, it's in, that, in a, a narrow space where the player feels that, Okay, I lost in this round, but I'm gonna win on the next one because I just won a little bit two spins ago. And that's exactly right. right? That's, that, okay. that's a good abstraction of how a slot designer thinks about it. Cool. And I, again, I could go on and on. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Dave, Anyone else? you wanna? Yeah. So one question I have, I have a good friend who's consulting for um, a European company that uh, has some land-based casino operations, some um, lottery operations. And uh, for years, they've had a lot of success building uh, what they call their you know, free-to-play operation, which is an exact replication of casino games, right? More or less a casino trainer. Um, but this hasn't really worked as their social casino strategy, right? They're seeing some important fall-aparts in what people want from a casino trainer and what they want from a, um, a Casino gaming, you know, free to play, happy experience. I just wonder, among folks that have worked on either or both of those product categories, what are the most important distinctions you've seen around what works in those two spaces? If anybody has, like him. Uh, well, I certainly have not worked in the land-based or real money. Um, I mean, generally we have had the most success when we have more closely rather than less closely replicated the land-based casino, especially the land-based slots experience. Um, so, you know, there certainly are things that we do differently and things that we can do differently because, you know, since we're not gambling, we're not regulated, you know, so we can do things like cheat and have the machine give you a win, you know, when you've had a long losing streak or when it looks like you're about to run out of tokens or that sort of a thing. It's not cheating, it's just giving you a better play experience. Yeah, yeah, but it's, you know, not uh, essentially just letting the dice roll randomly as real casinos have to do. Uh, but for the most part, you know, I feel like we're not straying too far from delivering the same experience and, and in fact, uh, you know, I think we have been over time moving more and more closely toward, toward replicating the casino experience. Yeah, I mean, in my case, on Thursday, we launch a game that doesn't replicate the casino experience at all, so we'll see what happens. I mean, we launch a game called Shrek Slots Adventure, and it's based on Shrek, and it has, has a level-based map, uh, and you go into a level, and the story goes that the, uh, uh, the Far Far Away is completely screwed up, and, and uh, Shrek has to fix it, and these machines have uh, eaten people, and, 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 and Shrek needs to beat the machine, uh, in order to free the people who are trapped inside. <laughs> and the way that, that, that you do that is by spinning, because every, every machine is a slot machine, but the 
machine has legs and it has a strong personality and um, a, and it makes fun of you, etc. Et it's, it's a machine who's alive. And uh, a, a, we, but a, based on what uh, we were talking a few minutes ago, we keep the play in the flow anyway. And there's a series of a lot of different objectives that come from other social uh, casino uh, mechanics, such as collectibles, such as uh, a, a, a different elements of gameplay, mini games. So it's a little bit more interactive. And that takes me to another topic that I think is, wor uh, is worth uh, mentioning, is that if you're talking about a slow machine, there are two different types of players in the slow machines. Those who are constantly engaged and, and they use the, the auto spin uh, to just keep uh, seeing the results, and those who are maybe more interested in the interaction. And we've seen, in the, in the, at least in the real gaming, Aladdin is a great example of a slot machine where you have a lot of mini games going on and it's 3D graphics and stuff like that. And, and, and that, that is, are there two different audiences for slot machine players? I mean, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, uh, that's absolutely true in land base too. And they're roughly, I don't know if we have formal names for them, but it has to do, usually has to do with the volatility of the slot experience. Yeah. And I kind of call them like real gamblers versus entertainment players. And you see that on slot floor. Like if you sit down to, you know, a WMS game like uh, Willy Wonka or uh, Wizard of Oz, you're gonna get, you're gonna play for a lot longer. There's a lot of interactivity. The the share is vibrating. But then you go over and you sit down at a game like Buffalo, which right. that is, the graphics are horrible. The sound is really boring. It's it seems like it's from the 80s, and yet those machines are everywhere and people love it. And that is a gambler game. You just, it's its like riding a very, very steep roller coaster and then you get that, you know, you win $185 in the bonus on a 30 cent bet and then you'll play that game forever. So they're two comp really different play experiences, yes. Um, I think uh, an interesting point in what you were just saying in your description of the Shrek slot uh, is layering on some of those, you know, more classic social And what's, you know, I'd, I'd say the most interesting new product that I've seen this year is um, My Biggest Blackjack uh, from Play Studios. And um, it is a blackjack only app, as the name implies. Um, and they have a levels based progression. So it unlocks new tables with, you know, basically, uh, you know, more hands or different side bets or higher bet levels. Um, but there's also a collection system. Uh, there are power. There's like a power-up meter which charges, and when it fills, it gives you a power-up. Um, there, as I said, you can play multiple hands at once. You can, uh, uh, on certain tables, uh, you can play side bets. You know, one of the things about blackjack is it's a pretty low volatile game. You know, either you lose your money or you double your money, but you can't, you know, sort of get a thousand to one return like you have a small chance of getting every time you spin a slot machine. And with these side bets, it makes blackjack not as volatile as the slot machine, but still a more a more volatile experience. It's sort of the roller coaster ride like Ernie was describing. Um, and you know, the game has done okay. Uh, you know, I see it, you know, sort of top 30, 35 under social casino. Um, you know, it's it's probably making okay money, um, but certainly not setting the world on fire, not doing certainly as well as uh, as the other Play Studios game, my biggest uh, slots. Um, but, uh, you know, is that because players are rejecting those, you know, kind of social systems, or is it because Blackjack is just inherently much less popular game than slots, and, you know, and, and it's doing well because of the social systems, you know, and merely being held back because of the, the subgenre that, that the game is set in. Uh, anyway, so I, I, I think that's a very interesting topic for conversation. But one thing I'd like to do is just get a show of hands of how many people over the past year have played any social casino game? And you know, of the group, um, how many have played the have played for fun as opposed to for research? <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, I was just interested in kind of getting the the temperature of the room on that. Okay, how many people have gambled for real money in the past year? Only for research. That's why I told Mario. Anyway, so yeah. Sorry, I wasn't sure if what I was.
was going to say, piggyback cleanly into what you were saying. Oh, hi. Joe Kane, uh, design director at IWIN. And I've actually worked with more people in this room than I think I should have been able to work with so far. So. Um, no, Ernie, I just wanted to, because you had mentioned loss as being something that was a real motivating factor for, for you know, or that the possibility of, of losing something. But I don't know that that same thing applies in these games. So that's what kind of was wondering, like, is it the social angle that is really replacing that for people that's keeping them playing? Or is it just something like inherently good about a slots experience that, you know, it's almost one of those things that you can't screw up. I mean, you can screw it up, but more, more like you have to work really hard to make it be not something you want to do. Because you, it, it, what, do you, what do you stand to lose? I mean, you're not, you're not, you're not, you don't have any chance of winning the big money. You can win tokens or you can win virtual currency, but you can't really put that in your pocket. Here, well, here's my theory. Now, this is, my, this is how I've wrapped my mind around social casino in general. So first of all, you, have, you generally have players who already like slot games. Now, uh, on the strip, for example, uh, you will get a return to player of 85% which is terrible, right? When you're playing uh, a social slot game, I, I don't, people don't publish their return to players, but I'm, I'm guessing it's around 95% plus. So right there, you're getting a lot more for your money. Also, it's cheaper to play. And the analogy I use is that it's kind of orange juice versus orange drink. Like everyone loves fresh squeezed orange juice. Everyone loves playing in a casino, but you can't always afford it every single morning. So you drink something that tastes a little bit like it, and the more it tastes like orange juice, the better it'll sell, but it's more affordable. I think it's that simple. I think it's, and that's why, uh, the more you can replicate the land-based experience, the better the games do. Because they're, they're getting some of that rush uh, just from all of the uh, accoutrements around. It feels like gambling, it, but it, it's missing the, you know, the pulp and the actual juice, but it still tastes pretty good. Well, I think it's it's also about creating a sense in the player that that virtual currency, those tokens, have a value. You know, maybe it's not as high a value as as cold hard cash, <coughs> but it still you know has some value to them, and they still do feel some amount of pain at losing it and seeing their balance go to zero and knowing they have to stop playing, or if they want to keep playing, that they have to pay at that point. So you know, I think you do get, you know, at least at least a, you know, a modicum of that adrenaline rush that you're talking about when when real money is on the line. The other thing I want to add is it's a lot of choice. So like I'm actually really really impressed with some of the big solo games. Like I want to say Rise of the Ring. Jack and Dang won't be able to work. Yeah, that's it. Um, so my name is Ross Mischer. I'm the CEO of a licensing agency called Brand Central. Um, and just wanted to kind of throw out the, to the group the role that licensing has been playing or will continue to play as we get tons and tons of, uh, as we represent lots of different licensors, we're getting lots of different requests from social casino companies wanting to license some of our brands. Um, and uh, we see, you know, and understanding the space, we see, you know, you get maybe front page, you know, the lobby space at the beginning, but then eventually, I guess as your game recoups, your license, your minimum guarantees recoup, you kind of go to the more locked stages. Um, so just wanted to get people's thoughts on the role of licensing within Social Casino. Well, we have several licensed products, uh, mostly game show properties, um, and mostly they're valuable to us as a user acquisition tool. Um, they, you know, they acquire much better than just sort of a generic triple seven slot machine image or something like that. Right. Um, certainly the, you know, the, the leader on the licensing front is Zynga. They, they must have 50 different licensed IPs and hit at rich slots. Um, so, you know, I would certainly love to hear from, you know, someone at Zynga about, you know, the economics of that and how that's working out for them. But they certainly, you know, don't seem to be slowing down on that front. If anything, they seem to be, you know, even accelerating more. And, and it's, it's interesting how, you know, there, there are many IPs which I would not think, you know, would resonate with, with our audience, uh, the Terminator and things like that. So I'm, I'm curious from your experience kind of doing this out licensing, right, of Barron's, 
brands into the space, have you got any taxonomy or any sense of what kind of brands tend to work and what kind of brands tend to flop? Well, it's interesting. We represent a handful of different brands from entertainment brands to corporate brands. And it seems like in the last even couple months, there is a big, not a shift necessarily, but you know, is I think the initial interest was mostly in the entertainment brands like the Shreks and the Wizard of Oz and things like that. And I think now, I think companies, especially like Zynga, are looking at corporate brands and seeing how they can tap into their you know, user base or tap into their Facebook and um, you know, brands that are you know, food brands or corporate brands that could be something that's kind of cute and, and quickly creating you know, apps around that. So I think there's a, an interesting surge in these corporate brands now beyond entertainment. I can't think of any that I've seen. I mean, you're talking about something like a Coca-Cola floss or a Nike floss. Yeah, Moon Pie I just saw and a bunch of other ones that are, are coming out. I mean, I think Zynga's snapping up a lot of, you know, corporate food brands and other brands too. Uh, I, I think it's kind of a losing proposition to go into a big brand land rush. I can tell you in, in land base, the re one of the reasons why brands work so well is because uh, the providers can charge the casinos our participation fee. So most of the slots that are not branded that you see are sold as boxes. And once the, once the casino has bought the box, then they don't see, the, the developer doesn't see any more money. But with the branded slots, they install the game and then they get ongoing revenue. And they can justify it because it's a brand. The, uh, in the online uh, gaming space, uh, in the real money space, it's exactly what Steve said, which is that they are generally acquisition tools. And you know, I can say that some of the some of the branded games we did at uh, IGT did quite well online. But the but the standard, you know, your standard Cleopatras and and you know the Buffaloes of the world end up making a lot more money online. So I I, I think that there's going to be a contraction in brands. I don't think it's a winning strategy and. And generally, there's, there's a huge difference, huge difference in revenue in land base between the successful brands and the rest of the brands, like orders of magnitude different. So Wheel of Fortune, Monopoly, Sex and the City, massive successes. And they're all related to money, whereas brands like Moon Pie, I would, I would bet they're losing money on it. We, we didn't talk about anything else besides slot machines. Shall we move into like bingo or some other games? Or, or even ask if there is an interest? Well, actually, yeah, clearly. Yeah, actually, I was going to a follow up question to that, and it kind of goes back to you know what the list is on the board there. Is there a, how many games can even stand on their own? I mean, every single, almost every single thing up there is a compilation, right? Are there even is it even a trend, or is there even any possibility that you guys that anybody sees that like there is a casino game that could stand on its own that isn't some you know huge like you know 10 20 30 50 game you know pack that you're well, getting the, the bingo games mm -hmm. tend to stand on their own but those but i mean yeah but they have all different rooms and yeah, different styles do, right they, uh, a whole bunch of different rooms and mechanics and things right. like that uh sure poker, poker, poker is also. a good example right yeah anything, I mean, I anything other than poker i've been running i've been running a game called fringo and i've been running it for two years but it's absolutely true that uh the, the uh, we have a version of bingo in a casino and that uh, version monetizes really well. The mobile version, we had to discover that uh, we need to use ads and uh, other forms of revenue rather than IAPs in order to make it successful. Um, but still, the, uh, there's an attraction for the social casino player to be part of a community. So I, I, wouldn't say, I would say more like a compilation, more like a community. Be part of a community is a big deal because um, uh, you want to compare yourself to uh, a, a, a how much winnings you have versus other people. And some, some casinos have done a really good job about uh, using the earnings into different things, such as, such, such as Vegas World is using uh, uh, outfits and condos that uh, people can buy with their, with their winnings and they create these parties where, I know, I know, I know, I know, I, know. I hear you, I saw you already, you don't have to repeat yourself. Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> right, right, and, uh, and yeah, yeah. But at any rate, uh, like in level-based uh, games, 
We'll like to uh, let everybody know if you guys want to drop your business cards. We'll create a, uh, a mailing list so we can continue having these discussions and have these conversations. And uh, we'll have about a three-minute break, and then we'll move into the next half hour, which is going to be on mid-core games.